Well, we're going to take a break from the Westminster Catechism as we've walked through that because I got turned on to something in Psalm 22. And I figure if I'm going to go off beat, I can do it in the evening service and everybody will be all right. (laughs) Uh, You know, when you hear something in a different voice that was familiar, but you hear it in a different voice, it sounds new. That's what happened to me last week. And, 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 you know, what often sounds new when you hear an English accent or a Scottish accent I don't know why that is. That's because James Bond is English and William Wallace is Scottish. And when they say stuff, you're like, well, i got to listen a little more now. I was reading uh, a sample text on my handy-dandy iPad here of this King James Bible. Now, it's like a really pretty King James Bible that has the first letter of each chapter is that really ornate, kind of swirly-looking thing. And I was like, man, that's just the most beautiful-looking and all it had was like a few chapters from Psalms, a few chapters from uh, the Gospels, and then a few other ones. So I was just reading them on my, because I can't afford to buy this Bible. This Bible is pricey. It's made, I think it's made from like the heavenly flock of goats or something. Like it's, it's made out of premium leather. Um, but I was reading it, and I was just kind of, you know, looking at it on here and the, and the way that's laid out. And th- I, Psalm 22 jumped off to me in a way that just was so fresh and new because I heard it in a, in a different voice. And it was verse 3. Verse 3 in the ESV says, Yet you are holy, but when it said in the King James, But thou art holy, I, it was just like a bell ringing in my head. That the first two verses of, of Psalm 22, they're familiar to us. Have we heard before verse 1? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Who quotes that? Jesus does, right? Yeah. Jesus quotes that as one of his seven sayings on the cross. And when you think about Jesus on the cross, he utters very few words. So they're all worth mentioning. They're all worth studying. What does he actually say in those literally last breaths that he has? One of those things is a quote from Scripture. But what jumped off to me was not those words, was the, was the verse 3. But thou art holy. He says, you've forsaken me. And then he goes on to say, you're far from saving me. Are you even hearing the words of my groaning? I, oh God, I cry by day, but you don't answer. And by night, and I find no rest. So you have this moment of despair. And then what... I, I've read it before, and I got in my old Bible and saw, like, oh, I've written notes next to it. But it just jumped off in the King James that he's, he voices this complaint. David's the author of the psalm, and we'll talk about David and then Jesus quoting David in a minute. But then the next thing he says after voicing a pretty serious complaint, you've forsaken me, you're not saving me, you're not, you, you don't listen to me, you're not there for me. And then his butt by thou art holy now that that was captivating to me more so than yet you are holy there's something about the word but that it just jars you like it just kind of shifts your gears this is true but this and it, it versus yet so that's what jumped off at me when, when David, who wrote this, that's what the, you know, those little, those little uh, pretexts at the top of each psalm where, you said, where it says, to the choir master according to the, the doe of the dawn, a psalm of David, that's Bible. Sometimes we don't know that. Uh, with that that's not something that the, the publisher put in. Those prescripts, those were written in the Hebrew. So we can know, oh, David wrote this. Like, it's written down in the original languages. So we know David wrote this. And he's feeling forsaken by God, far from saving. He's groaning into nothingness is what it feels like. And you don't answer, and I have no rest. And then he says, but thou art holy. Is that what's comforting him? The holiness of God? That's what it sounds like. Because he goes on, if you were here this morning, we read the whole psalm. Where I won't reread it again, but we'll, we'll hit on a few mountain peaks in it. He's in the pit of despair, misery, forsakenness. And the first thing he says 
to begin, in a sense, pulling himself out is the holiness of God. But I'm miserable, but you are holy. Why would that comfort him? Well, let's think about holiness. We talked about this before when we talked about it. Uh, some of the early questions in the catechism and just mentions that God is holy. But, but what is holiness? I think holiness, R.C. Sproul talks about, talked about this a lot in his ministry. He wrote a book called The Holiness of God and really helped bring the church into focusing in on, hey, we've overlooked this. That in God, all of God's attributes, in his righteousness, in his perfectness, in his omniscience, in his omnipotence, and all these things, he's wholly omnipotent. He's holy as he's righteous. He's ho his holiness is, is, in a sense, the overarching characteristic of God. And when we think holy, we, we tend, this is what we do with everything. We bring what, what attributes and defines God down to something very minute and small for us. So when we say holy, what do you immediately think of? Somebody who's holier than thou, right? That person's holier than thou, or, or, or a whole, he's a holy man, or it's a holy Bible. It's just kind of like this, oh, like uh, that, that's what we think of. We think of something that's just kind of special and, and uh, extra and just kind of maybe has a little bit of a, you know, glowing R thing, right? You think you're better than us. You think you're better than me that that's not what the word means. The best way that I've heard it described is, again, by R.C. Sproul. I just can't do better than what that guy said. He talked about it as, and he's pulling from church history and other theologians in the scriptures, is that holiness is equivalent to God's otherness, that he's other than us, and, and not in a sense that he is... Uh, some kind of unknowable being, but, but that he is not the same as us. And when I hear that, the first thing I think of is, yeah, but aren't we his image bearers? And what we do is we reverse that. We say, we, we know that the Genesis 1, 26, 27, talks about us bearing the image of God, right? That let's make man in our image, says the Trinity, to himself. And we reverse that that we make God in our image. There was some 1700s theologian who said God created man in his image, and ever since then, man's been returning the favor, right? He's been reversing it back. And that's what we do. We, 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 make, we say, I don't know, I know who I am and what I do and what I have, and God's just an extra big version of that. And it didn't help us that when somebody in the 1930s and 40s created the cartoon Superman, that that's what we think of as God. He's like me, just bigger, stronger, faster, and uh, less vulnerable. But that word other, that he's other than us, we bear his image, he doesn't bear our image. And images can be misleading, right? Have you ever found a picture of yourself and been like, yo, we, have, you, have you ever had that happen? Have you ever had to retake a picture because you looked at it and you were like, oh, let's redo that. That doesn't look good. There was one time we took a Christmas picture. I forget when it was, but it was just you and me before we had kids. And I had flowing cinnamon hair. And uh, it wasn't flowing. It was thinning. And I was holding on <laughs> for dear life. And I had a long beard. And we were at a, my cousin's wedding. And, and we kind of took a a picture close to each other and we, I was in a suit and all that and we sent that out as a Christmas card and people legitimately thought Anna why'd you send out a Christmas card with you and your uncle <laughs> like with you and your like like who, who is that guy in the picture with you it's got to be a family member because you're kind of smushed up cheek to cheek and I was like people who know me it wasn't people who were like we don't know who you're married to but an image cannot represent you very well now, I looked pretty old, and that was at a time when my boss, he, when I was 24, he said, I would not have pegged you for a day under 40. <laughs> my boss said that to me when I was 24. He's asking me when we have kids, and I was like, well, I guess I need to do something about my hair, my beard, and look a little more appropriate for Anna's sake so that I don't make her look so bad. But images cannot fully represent the thing, Right? That, that that wasn't really what I looked like. People on, 
on average, didn't like see me and go, oh, you look like Anna's uncle. They were like, oh, it's Stuart, but you just kind of had to part the hair to get to, get to you. You can, you know, not perfectly represent the actual true thing. So we do that with God. No, we, we, his image in us is not absent, but it is marred. It's, it's not erased, but it is effaced in us, right, as sinners. And even not as sinners, as Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall, they didn't perfectly represent God. But God's holiness is one of those elements that we don't perfectly represent, that he is, he is other than us. Surely it means that his purity and his righteousness is infinite, but it's something that he's all together. When, when people encounter God in the scriptures, what do they do? What, is, what does Isaiah do in chapter 6? When the angels are floating around and he's seeing the temple room of God, the throne room of God in the temple, and they're singing, holy, 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 he hits the deck and says, I'm going to die right here. What does Peter do in the boat when Jesus says, hey, early on in his ministry, in Luke chapter 5, hey, throw, the, throw it over here. He's like, oh. He feels the tug on the fish and then sees what it is. And then Peter hits the deck and says, get away from me, I'm a sinner. See, when you're around the holiness of God, you're very aware of your unholiness. The, the total difference between you. When Paul meets Jesus on the road, he's not just kind of like, oh, man, that's a weird kind of a light. He's knocked off his horse, in the pictures at least. Who knows if he's riding a horse? He's at least knocked onto the ground by the light in the middle of the day, by the holiness of God. So why would that, why would, when you say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You're far from saving me. You're not hearing my groaning. You're not answering me. But thou art holy. Why would that comfort? Why would that comfort him? I think if you're in this moment that David's in, when you feel truly forsaken, truly alone, fearing everything, exposed and vulnerable on all sides from all these enemies, like it says later on in the psalm, he says, I'm a worm and not a man. I'm scorned by mankind. I'm despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They, they surround me and they encompass me. I'm poured out like water. My heart's melted like wax. Dogs encompass me. Evildoers encircle me. When you're in that moment, what do you want to know is true about your God? That he's bigger. That he's more powerful. That he's stronger. That he's other. That he's not just Samson. Samson can come in and crack some skulls and pick up a jawbone and, and beat some guys up. But all you have to do is cut his hair, and then he's done. And then you can gouge his eyes out and treat him like a donkey. When you're in this place, your hope is in God's holiness. Because that encompasses his goodness, his mercy, his strength, his omnipotence, and his power. And the significance of this psalm it shouldn't be lost on us. How many things in here do we see that David's saying centuries before that is true of Jesus? Have you ever looked at it? Look at verses one. verse 1. We know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus quotes that very verse in Matthew 27, 46. But then look down as it goes. I'm a worm and not a man. I'm despised by people. I'm mocked. And then verse 7. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me and they wag their heads. You know, in Matthew 27, it says that about the Pharisees as they are around the cross. They're wagging their heads at Jesus. And then it goes on um, to be about Jesus. The, the, the strong bulls surround me. The powerful people surround me. I am poured out like water, verse 14. All my bones are out of joint. They're not broken. They're just all, dis they're all yanked out. My heart melts like wax. Verse 15, my strength is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue sticks to my jaws. That's thirst. What does Jesus say? Is one of his seven saying, I thirst. The dogs encompass me. Company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. That's what it says. Pierced my hands and feet. That's the most obvious thing about Jesus. I can count all my bones. I'm so exposed. That, that you can see the ribs that he's malnourished and, and beaten. And then verse 18, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. 
We know that the, the, the soldiers do that with Jesus' clothing, right? Just to mock him, because it wasn't like it was nice clothing. So David's feeling these things. Jesus feeling these things. And this aloneness, this true oppression, true antagonism. When, when you think about the, the aloneness, when, when you have to pray, verse 19, but you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. When you feel that alone, or like in verse 11, be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. When you th- have you felt that alone? I mean, maybe not even just physically. It's, it's really for us more just even relationally. That you're standing alone on some principle, that, that, you, that nobody's supporting you, that you're totally out in the wind by yourself and totally exposed, being forsaken. Have you ever thought, but God is holy? That's what comforted David when he, in his pain. And then that's what comforts Jesus in his pain. Centuries later, Jesus finds the same comfort here. I mean, why quote this if you're Jesus? We know Jesus from Hebrews 4, 15, and 16, he suffers like us, right? It says, uh, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We draw near to the throne of grace. And now let's think about these, think about these verses right here. Jesus is our high priest, and he can sympathize with us. He's gone through what we've gone through. So that aloneness, that forsakenness, that oppression, that physical exhaustion, that mental uh, exhaustion, that he did it without sin. And so because of that, we can draw near to the throne of grace with confidence. When Isaiah is in the room of the throne of grace, does he have confidence? No, he has horror. When John in Revelation chapter 1 is in the throne, of, throne room of grace, does he have confidence? He has horror. But through Christ, we can have confidence that we're going to receive what? A spanking? Judgment? No, oh, mercy and grace and help. In the time when we're in the presence of the holiness of God through Christ, then we don't have to fear that. That holiness comforts us. And that holiness guarantees us what we need most, mercy, grace, and help. This, when it, as it starts to connect, this sends the hearer that Jesus would say, why quote this? If, you just, if you're only going to say seven, I'm pretty sure it's seven sayings on the cross. I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure it is. But if you're going to, limited number of sayings that you're going to say from hanging up on that actual piece of wood in the climactic moment of history, of human history, and you're going to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quote verbatim from Psalm 22, why send us there? Sympathize with us. But then the next psalm is what? Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He prepares a table in front of my enemies for me. He's so invested in me and he does love me that he'll put a table out in front of my enemies and hold a banquet for me and they can all watch. That's how secure I am. I can sit down and eat in front of them. And then you get to Psalm 24 like we read. So if you you want to see it, you can see the death of Christ in Psalm 22. You can see the resurrection of Christ in Psalm 23. And then you can see the exaltation in Psalm 24 that we read this morning. Why, what does it say? In verse 7 of Psalm 24, Lift up your gates, your heads, O gates, be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Heaven, wake up, the King of glory is coming. And who is he? He's the Lord of hosts, strong and mighty mighty in battle so when jesus is on the cross he quotes from one particular psalm so that you see him dying and then you keep reading and you see the lord is my shepherd he's with me in the valley of the shadow of death he defends me he protects me he does that by rising again 
And then he's going to ascend into heaven, into glory. And the psalmist is saying, wake up, heaven. Guess who's coming in? The king of glory. The holiness of God. That's what comforts us. That's the, the mark of the true shepherd. I mean, I, I, I was debating before this week whether which one to preach this morning. Th this message or the one from this morning because it just was, they just connect so much that you draw drawn to the shepherd who is holy. And that holiness, it, it's not a deterrent to us. Normally when we talk about his ho holiness period, it's like a, a, a get away from me kind of thing. I don't want to be around that either because you make me feel weird or you act weird and I don't like it. But when David's at his lowest, he says, but thou art holy. You are holy. When Jesus is at the most suffering that any person will ever endure ever, he says, but you are holy. Even though I feel forsaken, even though I, I, you, I, you're not hearing me, it doesn't sound like you're hearing me, it doesn't feel like you're hearing me, you are holy. It draws us to that. So our, the holiness, it doesn't drive us away at our weakness, it draws us in. It pulls us to him. It's our greatest comfort because if he's not holy, then what can he do for me that would actually help? If, if Psalm 22, verse 3, just says, but you are just, or but you are wrathful, those are true and good things about God, what would that, what would that do for me? Or, or you are kind, or you are gr uh, nice. What would that do for me? I am in the pit, and I need something outside of me, totally different than me, above all of this. Otherwise, I have no hope. Because that's what the psalmist says, right? You are holy. And verse 3 goes on, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. And you they trusted and were not put to shame. You, the holy God, you have a track record of delivering everyone who trusts in you because you're holy. And if you're not holy, if you're not other, if you're not above all of this, then you can't do anything for me. You can't fix any of the mess that I'm in right now. But you are, so you can. You are holy, and therefore you can. And this is what you've always done. Think about the graciousness. The psalmist, he only has, up to that point, he only has this much Bible. We have this much Bible. We have a lot more history to go on than what he had. And then we have church history to look back on to, even how faithful saints throughout the generations have trusted the Lord, and he's, he's provided for them. He has cared for them, even in, the, in the, the pit of misery. So the holiness of God comforts his children in their time of need in a way that just nothing else can. He takes us out. He sets our wobbly legs on the rock that cannot move. And that's real comfort. That's real hope. That's what a true shepherd does for his sheep. I'm done. Let's pray. Lord, we, we come before you and we consider your holiness and we have to admit, I have to admit, that when I'm suffering, when we feel alone and abandoned and we're hurting, that's not the first thing that we think of, but that was the first thing that David thought of. And, and, and that was where your son sent us from one of his sayings on the cross to be comforted by your holiness. And Lord, that we can come into the throne room, the, the literal pulsing core of the universe, of your holiness emanating from that, if we had to locate it, that's where it would be. We can come in there through the one who was on the cross and truly felt and the forsakenness that we can receive what we need most, which is grace and mercy and help. And that we can come confidently, not, not with a servile quaking, but we can come in confidently into the place of holiness 
into the holy of holies even because you you ripped that veil that kept us out the very moment or right around the very moment that Jesus said those words why have you forsaken me sending us to the next verse which says but you are holy and we thank you for letting us know that and comforting us through that through your holiness that we find comfort and rest that we don't have a God that is impotent we don't have a God that's going to roll up his sleeves and try his best when we are in our greatest need but we have a God who is entirely above all of this and all of this that we know, see, and experience is under the realm of your sovereign hand. It, it is all in the realm of creation. Nothing else is on your level. No threat, no pain, no demon, no devil is on your level. They're underneath you, underneath your control, and all that they do. So, Lord, we do find great comfort in those words, but thou art holy. And may we continue to do so. May we continue to dive into that, that biblical truth of your holiness. And may we, may we be in awe and may we be filled with joy that we're allowed, like the president's kids, to come into the Oval Office, to come into the Holy of Holies. And you welcome us there. And you say that you will give us what we need most every day, which is grace and mercy and help. So we pray to you as the holy triune God of the universe that we can just do this right now from here. Not wearing special clothes, not, not on a special day. We can come waltzing right in to your presence. And what a gift that is. And may we appreciate it, hold on to it, cling to it, and know it more and proclaim it to others. And it's through only the whole of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.